If you really want to hear about it, the first thing you probably want to know is where I was born and what my lousy childhood was like and how my parents were occupied now before they had me and all that David Copperfield kind of crap. But I don't feel like going into it if you want to know the truth. It is with these words that the classic novel Catcher in the Rye begins, and it is with these words that we see Holden Caulfield's state of mind begin to unfold. His narration annoys some, relates to many, and frankly depresses most, but it is also what endears us to Holden. It connects us to his cause while simultaneously keeping us at a distance, as if Holden is saying, come closer, but not too close. He skims the surface of things, hinting at the deeper issues beneath his dry, surly surface without actually addressing those deeper issues. He likes to say things like, I don't feel like going into it if you want to know the truth because it allows him to tell you what he wants to say without really telling you. It reveals more than he would probably like to admit. Isn't this something we all tend to do with God? We'll ask him to take up our worries and forgive our sins, but then we hold back. We don't entirely let go of the reins and let God take them along with everything else because it scares us. Now, I speak using the royal sense of we, and that I largely speak of myself, because holding back has always been something I have a penchant for. I took a poetry class last semester in which I wrote a poem about religion, or rather, someone falling away from religion, but just at the end that they start to turn back. In the first draft, I skirted around the issue, not sure what my classmates would think of me if I went the whole nine yards and afraid of their inevitable critique. The best advice I got that whole semester was when my teacher told me, if you're gonna write about it, write about it. Go at it, full force. I had to let go of my insecurities and let the poem take me where it would. It ended up being something that I'm still proud of to, to this day. As a perfectionist and as the type of person who likes to personally see things through until the very end, letting go and letting God has been something I've grappled with for a long time. I set incredibly high standards for myself and gave myself quite the hard time if I ever missed the mark. Something I've had to realize is that letting God take care of things doesn't mean admitting defeat. It means embracing my failures, admitting my humanness, my inability to carry everything on my own, and further, the necessity for loving God that is more than able. Upon the first couple times I read Catcher in the Rye, this tendency to take everything on my own shoulders and refuse to admit my own weakness is a trait that I also found in Holden. He does not like needing people. He puts so much pressure on himself to keep children, especially his little sister Phoebe, young and innocent. In fact, the whole book is molded around this image that children are running through a field of rye, carefree and ignorant of the world's faults. Holden is among them, ready to catch the ones that get too close to the edge of the field and almost fall over the cliff into adulthood. Thus, Holden wants to be the catcher in the rye, keeping the kids that come through the rye from growing old and becoming aware of the phoniness in the world. And this is Holden's signature phrase, calling everyone but himself a phony. The concept represents everything wrong with people in society, all the hypocrisy, pretension, shallowness that pervades culture. Paul Holden goes about and acts as though he is the only genuine, honest person alive. But refusing to acknowledge his own behavior as fitting into the phony mold is comparable to hipsters nowadays that refuse to admit their hipster status. <laughs> what Holden doesn't realize is that by making himself the exception, he makes himself the very epitome of a phony. Setting himself apart only puts him exactly where he doesn't want to be because it's where everyone else is. He is not the marked individual that he angst his angsty mind calls himself. And just as every teenager feels at some point, the cliche phrase, but no one understands me. <laughs> he realized that, yes, to an extent, the problem for Holden, however, is not so much that no one understands him, but that no one will listen to him in the first place. He seeks a willing ear wherever he can find it, desperately walking the streets of New York and feeling more and more frustrated and alone all the while. He goes so far as to hire a prostitute to come to his room to just talk to him. To listen, to know that there is someone out there that will end his stream of meaningless interactions. But it fails. Every person he reaches out to turns away. When Holden tries asking his cab driver about where the ducks in the Central Park Pond go during the winter, the cab driver scoffs at him and asks if he's joking. There are many interpretations of this scene, and you could read it virtually any way you wanted, but my favorite reading is that when Holden asks about the ducks, he's really asking about himself, and directly saying, what happens to me in the winter when the pond freezes over? What will happen to me? Where will I be in a few months? It's a question I ask myself a lot. What is God's plan for my life? 
What direction am I headed? Is it a good one? It's a wonderful relief to know that asking these sorts of questions don't, doesn't disinterest God like it disinterested the cab driver before. We never have to be afraid of God being impatient or ignoring us because he died to save us, to help us carry the crosses we take so heavily on our shoulders, to show us the kind of love that can only come from God who is love himself. Holden has a character with many crosses to bear. His younger brother, Ali, died of leukemia several years before the time of the novel, something that Holden still deals with on a day-to-day -day basis, whether he admits it or not. On top of that, he recently flunked out of school and is now wandering around New York to avoid going home and having to face his parents. He is riddled with loneliness and is desperate for comfort. Okay. <laughs> Everywhere he looks, there seems to be a reason to hate the world and fear adulthood more, because adulthood means phoniness to him, and as much as he would like to be the captain of the ride and save all of the children from entering into that phoniness, he is bitterly aware of his incapability and powerlessness, not to mention his solitude and having to deal with it. As a church, and as Christians, our solitude is filled and erased by the presence of other believers and the saints in heaven. Most of all, however, our solitude is ameliorated at the cross. Not only does Christ offer us steady arms to carry us when things become too much to bear, but he bestows us with his own yoke. In Matthew chapter 11, verse 29, he says, take my, yoke, take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Our sorrows and loneliness, much the same as those that Holden carries, become a delight when we delight Christ and a joy when he embraces our weakness as it is made strong by him. It's a truth that, thankfully, we don't have to walk around New York to try to find. But there is some hope for Holden. His sister Phoebe becomes the willing ears he spent the whole novel trying to find. She understands some things that Holden doesn't, and is able to put things in perspective. For instance, she realizes that Holden's romanticized view of childhood being full of laughter and innocence is really nothing more than an idealized fantasy. Phoebe sees the deep sadness that stews within Holden, and his deeper need for love and support. Later in the book, when Holden tells her that he plans to leave New York entirely and hitchhike west, she meets him at the Museum of Art and tries to make him take her along. And it's not something she does because she needs Holden, as it is something she does because she knows that Holden needs her. The novel ends with Holden watching Phoebe ride around and around on a carousel in the park. He's wearing his favorite red hunting hat, which I haven't mentioned in this talk because it's the book's biggest symbol. There are a million interpretations of it, and honestly, I don't really know what I think about it myself. Um, but as he sits there, he watches his little sister. He begins to feel so happy that he feels like he can cry. He's still very much the scared, lonely, melancholic boy that brought us along this crazy journey, except now maybe he's a little less scared, a little less lonely, because he has feet. Holden's final words bring everything to a close. Don't ever tell anybody anything. If you do, you start missing everybody. He's growing, little by little. He's starting to value the people around him, and his nostalgic tone reveals that maybe some of his cynicism has lessened too. Most characters that Holden meets want to take something from him, but Phoebe doesn't. She's there for him. She returns to him his red hunting hat, and, starts to sh and he starts to shed a few barriers. It's the end of capturing the ride, but perhaps it's a start. Thank you.